Hi everyone, how are you doing today? It's the middle of the afternoon, is lunch getting to you? Also, we'll talk about pain and magic, and that will, that will hopefully help. The title of the, topic, uh, the talk is Bulletproof Jobs. I gave a talk with the exact same title in San Francisco for the Spark Summit last June. The content was completely different because the problem's perennial, right? We want our jobs to run well over long periods of time, and we don't want them to fail much. When they do fail, we want it to be very easy to find and fix the problems. It's kind of holy grail, right? It's totally doable. This is very important for us at Swoop because actually our business sort of runs on Spark. And what I mean by runs on Spark, we do online advertising. We have absolutely nothing to do with the big annoying ads you see online. We hate them just as much as you do. But nonetheless, if you're dealing with online advertising, you're dealing with data that comes over HTTP, it's unreliable, and ultimately how you make money, how you bill your clients, is based on the big data crunching that you've done with everything that your users did. So basically, we build clients through Spark. You can say our company runs on Spark. Petabyte scale data engineering, lots of machine learning, but rather than me making this be a talk about something really cool we did with our data, which is nothing like your data, to solve a problem which is nothing like the problems you're solving, I want to talk about fairly nitty-gritty things that most likely all of you are facing if you're using Spark at any kind of scale. Let's first talk about Spark versus magic. The greatest thing about Spark, there is a general purpose open platform for big data processing. The absolutely worst thing about Spark is there is a general platform for big data processing. See, when you're general, you can't make any assumptions. You can't make assumptions about my data, about my problems, about my workflows. And as a result, I have to always tell you absolutely everything down to the very last bit of what I want you to do. It's like having a kid who's really eager to help, but every time they want to take the trash out, you have to teach them again exactly how we do it. You open the door under the sink, you pull the thing out. It gets, it gets a little annoying. Magic, on the other hand, is opinionated in software. Magic needs to make assumptions because it needs to do things behind your back implicitly. So great magic comes from sane, smart conventions. And the amazing thing about Spark, as opposed to, say, a SQL database, is that the structure of Spark, the openness above the storage layer, as Ted talked earlier, and at the API layer, actually makes it much, much, much easier, and I mean sort of 10 plus X easier, to add magic on top of Spark. Magic, in this case, means libraries, frameworks, code that, when bound with the way you work, make your life a lot easier. So let's talk about some really basic problems that all of you, again, if you've done any kind of production work with Spark, have encountered. First problem is, you, your job just failed. What are you going to do? Well, it's kind of an unfair question because you don't know what your job did. You don't know how it failed. So maybe you'll say, I have to go look at it. Well, to me, that's already a problem. I don't want to get interrupted every time something fails. And we run in the cloud. In our case, actually, 98% of failures are transient, meaning they just go away after a while, but they just happen to mess up the job right now. So if I told you that in your case, most likely, especially if you're in the cloud, more than 90% of your failures will be transient, does that help you decide what to do when the job failed? And most people probably say no, because you don't actually know what the job is doing, so you can't give me a definitive answer. And that's a problem. If I had a magic wand, because we're talking about magic, I'd like my system to just auto retry the job, right? The problem's going to go away. But then this kind of question comes, well, would that be OK? Or more like, when would it be OK to auto retry jobs that failed? Well, it'll be OK if they're idempotent. How many of you know what idempotency is? Excellent. For those who you don't, in this context, it basically means that you can rerun an operation without it changing the state of the system. Simplest example, drop table if exists. If the table's there, it deletes. If the table's not there, it succeeds quietly. The end state is that the table no longer exists. So idempotent operations you can think of them in terms of the outcome they create as opposed to the actions they execute. The prototypical non-idempotent operation in big data is appending data. Appending data can only be described in terms of the action that it does because it keeps changing the outcome. You should probably never, ever, ever 
you save more append in Spark or any big data system. One of the problems with Spark being general is that Spark actually has absolutely no idempotent I.O. Unless you're doing I.O. against a transactional database in the context of a transaction, which is not really a really huge data case. So, so let's ignore that. It has one semi-idempotent way, which is overwriting data. It's semi because in big data, overwriting can actually take quite a bit of time. And when, before you begin an overwrite, you bust all the files in the target directories. Well, what if somebody depended on them? What was another job that either had a reference? Or what if your meta store, if it was a table, had a reference to those things? What if somebody's going to want to read from there? Worst case, they read half stale data. So it's a problem. But if you could ensure your jobs are right and potent, you could automatically retry them. And that's what we did at Swoop. We basically made sure that all our jobs are right and potent, and we stopped being bothered about 98% of the time. That's what I call magical. This is the power of a smart convention. Now, the techniques for actually making Spark do item potent I.O. are a little bit tricky, but that's what my talk in San Francisco was about. And so if you Google it or if you follow this link, you will find it if you're interested in that. But I strongly recommend it. In fact, I would argue that after correctness, item potency is the second most important property of any job or operation that creates side effects in a complex system with high failure rates. And I strongly encourage you to make all your jobs that important. Let's look at another problem. So we stop being bothered 98% of the time. So now we get bothered when there's a real problem. And just to make the example more realistic, let's just say that we processed a bunch of data. And for whatever reasons, dirty data coming in, upstream problem, bugs in our code, there's going to be a number of different exceptions, and quite a large number. So how do we find and fix all? Well, if you think about the way Spark does exception handling, we already have a problem. Spark's general default way of doing things is to fail on the first exception application code. That's absolutely terrible. When would you ever want, when you have five different kinds of errors and a 1,000 of them, to fail on the very first one? with essentially no output. Remember the days, some of you old enough, when compilers failed on the very first error on the very first file? And you had to recompile 20 times to find all the errors? At some point, we decided to be smart. and said, hey, look, this is not good for the human workflow. How about I tell you about as many of the errors as I can so you can fix them all at once? So you can say, OK, well, I can maybe log. I'll catch the errors, and I'll put them in a log file. Ever seen the log file of a multi-terabyte job? I mean, those things run to gigabytes. So good luck finding the exceptions in there. Well, you could use a structured logging system. That's a better idea. Until you hit a job which, by some coding bug, ends up slamming your structured logging system with, say, errors on 50% of inputs and brings it down to its knees instantaneously. So if you had a magic wand, I would say that um, I'd want errors to kind of be part of the job output somehow. Yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to separate them. Well, let's not worry about it, because we're holding a magic wand. I'd also want detailed exception information. Spark runs on the JVM. JVM has nested exception causes. Each has a stack trace. I don't want all of that info. I don't want to lose any of it. I want to be able to summarize the errors, right? If I'm not a big job, I don't want them given to me one at a time. I want to be able to say, hey, you know, uh, tell me how many different types of exceptions there are. Tell me how, what's the number of them, how are they distributed across the data. Uh, you may want to group by different criteria, by the origin location of the exception, by the location in your code that actually caused the error, which may be very different than where the exception actually was from, by the source data, but by some other property specific to you. After you decide how you want to drill, you want to drill into things. And by the way, errors typically are the kind of errors that you know about, and you probably have standardized ways of handling uh, responses for them, but they're also unknown errors. 
would be particularly interested in drilling down into the unknown errors. So we also want to have a way to separate known from unknown. You want to link to the source data. Why? Because sometimes an exception doesn't make much sense unless you can look at the data that produce the exception. Many times, jobs work together and produce outputs that then get linked with other outputs. We call those things flights at swoop. So sometimes, often, you want to know um, the flight that produced this data and the error. So we can do that using a very old smart convention from sort of pre-email data. We clearly need to keep some additional information around in addition to our data. And we don't want to modify the schema of our data because then we will force people dealing with the change schema. So instead, we're going to wrap our data in an envelope, a struct, a stat set, and we're going to put the fields we need in there. Well, it happens to be that on Monday, we open source that part of our magical toolkit, and we call it Spark Records. And I'll give you a link, but you can also find it if you search. The basic idea is really, really simple. And there's your data. And my pointer's too weak. But it's whatever you want it to be. Typically, if you're using Scala, it's a case class. Why? Because it makes it really easy to work with data sets. And then you see the other fields we talked about. You see the source, which is of whatever your input type is. If it's a string, it's a string. It's an int. It doesn't really matter. You have the flight. That's typically a string. It's just some kind of a you know, longish ID. Um, you have features. And those are, let's call it for internal optimization. They're just a bit field with a bunch of bit flags that make it very, very easy to scan and find records of particular type. And then you have this thing which looks kind of complicated, an optional sequence of issues. So we haven't talked about issues. But if you think about how you're going to manage nested exceptions with multiple stack traces and causes and potentially other kinds of messages, that's what it is about. And you kind of may be wondering, OK, you know, row level log file, that sounds interesting. It's nice to have a log file at the level of a single unit of output, or I can put debug messages, errors, other things. But uh, isn't it kind of complicated to build this? And the answer is it doesn't have to be, because we have record builders for that. A record builder is about seven lines of boilerplate. You extend the record builder, build data, you put the code that you would have used to perform the transformation yourself. And again, just to be clear, we're talking about complex transformations you do in your code as opposed to transforming data through a number of small sequences of, of Spark transformations. That's a completely different use case. Um, and then there are two other methods. One is how to build a data record, and one is how to build an error record. They're there simply to give you sort of ultimate flexibility in how to tune things, because you can add your own fields to records in the header portion that are specific to your use case. And this complex thing, the issues, they just get passed in. The framework catches exceptions, collects messages, does all kinds of magic, and then just hands it over to you and say, please put it in the issues field in the record. More importantly, if we made this decision to use an envelope, we don't want to force this knowledge on everybody else downstream in our data pipeline. We actually want to be able to use this transparently. So you can just grab the record data. That's a method that the framework will automatically add to your data frames or data sets. And it will magically find just the data records, skipping all the other records, regardless of how you're structuring the storage, flat, partition, doesn't matter. And then if you really want to hide it from your users, you could actually create a global or temporary view. Transparency, when you take in a dependency on a third-party API library, it's a very, very desirable property because it helps you decide whether you want to expose it or whether you want to create a boundary. Viral frameworks, viral uh, dependencies, ones that spread and pollute your entire code base, could be great if they're absolutely wonderful, but they create friction over time and should be very carefully um, thought about. So let's look at what root cause analysis with records looks like. And keep in mind, we started all this with the goal of being able to do fast root cause analysis. So if my screen, which had issues, works well, 
and by the way, the resolution is kind of slightly whacked. Um, and I apologize for that. But, but let's talk about a, an insanely simple example that's actually part of the framework we open source. So you don't have to categorize numbers. It's about as simple as it gets. But it has a few sort of real world twists. There's some inputs we should skip, like zero. It's a row of data, if you think about it, for which we don't want to generate a row of output. There's some inputs that generate errors. And also, just to make things interesting, we introduced a bug in the code. So we go, should get, for some inputs, unexpected errors. So let's bring, is this readable? Yes, I think it is. Um, so we bring in Spark records. We bring in the example code. Job context, we don't have to worry about in a simple case. It's just one line of boilerplate for various services available um, to the jobs you can see. And then we're just going to um, build this on the input from negative 5 to 100. We should already expect at least five errors from negative 5 to negative 1 because those numbers are supposed to be um, errors. We're using map partitions simply because the build records API, in order to be fairly generic and handle different cases, actually allows you to produce more than one output for each input. And it's simply easier to plug in without having to type dot sequence, dot twitterator, to plug it with map partitions. And then we write with save mode override two fancy numbers, negative 5 to 100. It's about as simple as it gets. So let's run this and see what happens. Spark is waking up. You can see we run on Databricks. Um, the guys have been very good and sort of save us from having to deal with the issues of dealing with Spark. So first problem, when your job finishes, Spark produces the magic underscore success file. Does this mean your job actually succeeded? No, it just means that I/O succeeded. What if you got garbage from upstream and produced garbage as a result? That's not really success. So people typically handle this with data quality checks. A typical data quality check is you're going to go and query the data you just wrote. Problem with that is it takes time. Isn't there a way to, for the most common cases of extreme failure, to just know immediately whether we succeeded or failed? And if you set yourself that as the goal, you realize that you need another way to collect context about how the job ran that doesn't involve going out to the output files. Spark has one way of doing this, and it's called accumulators. How many of you know accumulators? Great. Typical accumulators would let you sort of keep a, a long or a double counter across your jobs. That's not particularly interesting. We want to be able to collect arbitrary information about sort of at the application level about how our job ran. And so we introduced a thing called Spark Metrics, which uses a very, very fancy accumulator under the covers that can do all kinds of tricks. But in this case, we're using it to basically keep a map of counts. The keys in the map are all the various things you want to collect counts of, and then the values of the counts. So you can think of it as a map of accumulators, almost. And that allows us to build some very basic default data quality checks. In this case, on simple things like, hey, what's the minimum number of inputs I should have seen? Because very often a failure is, you had a problem upstream, and so you essentially had a zero row input. Spark happily, instantaneously processes the zero row input, produces zero output, and says, I'm done. Yeah, but you're not really doing well. You actually have a problem. And the max error rate. So let's run this. And we get an exception. Data quality check fails, just as we would have expected, because we should have at least five errors. Except that we see that we have six errors. So that's kind of interesting. That's something unexpected. So let's grab our records. And let's just look at the record data schema. Yeah, we can get the record data as if the record didn't exist. It's just the number and the category. Remember, our job is to categorize integers. But the record schema itself is actually a bit more complicated. And in particular, you see how complicated issues is. Issues is a triply nested array of structs in order to handle all the full fidelity of nastiness that can happen in a JVM exception stack, which, by the way, is not serializable. 
you can't just grab an exception and serialize it in Java. So there is a lot of trickery in capturing the right context. So first thing we can do is let's just get an overview of the statistics collected during Java execution. This comes out of the accumulator. It involved no queries. It was instantaneous. And right here we can see a few things. The job itself produced a couple of custom ones about numbers even and odd, but everything else was actually automatically collected by the framework. So you have your skip count, that's the zero down here. Oh, I cannot select. We have um, our error count, which is six, and so on and so forth. It's those default metrics that actually make it possible to do default quality checks in most basic cases. There's a few other things. There's issue counts and issue categories. And if you're an experienced parse record user, you will already know that there's something interesting going on because there's these issue ID counts. And it says that issue ID 1, 1001, versus issue category 1 is 6, and this is 5. This means that there's one issue of category 1 that doesn't have an ID. What are we talking about here? Well, remember the problem of wanting to separate known from unknown errors? Known errors have mitigatable, understood behaviors. We know how to deal with them. So a best practice is to actually use the capabilities of Spark Records to assign IDs to known errors so that you can then hone in on the unknown ones. But IDs are not easy to read, so how about we get some summaries on the issue counts? So we have one warning with two counts, which is about rare numbers. And um, we have two errors. One is number out of range, and it is the expected one. We gave it inputs from negative 5 to negative 1, those errors. And then here is the one with a null ID message, which means that it's unknown. Count of 1, index out of bounds exception. Great, so let's drill into the unknown errors. And there could be many errors. There could be many DNA origination points. I'm interested in the line in my code that caused the exception because that helps me most quickly hone in on what might be going on. In this case, the example was from the examples fancy numbers package. So I'm basically saying, hey, could you please hone in? And in terms of location, group the errors by locations that only match those group of lines and the stack trace and give me the first one. And so we get our exception. We know the location. It is the, it's the example builder class. It's in the category method. The file name is driver because that example is in the test part of the code base of the framework, therefore not visible if you add the jar file to Spark. So I just copied and pasted all the code. You get the line number, and actually you have a sample record with the input source, which in this case is 100. The bug is just a one-off index error. An array should have been made for the prime numbers up to 101 in order to handle inputs from 0 to 100. So this is how easy it is when you have all the processing power of Spark and the right data model for your errors to drill in and do root cause analysis. Most importantly, you could tune this to your own needs. At Swoop, we take messages from untrusted sources. We work with publishers and app developers, and they sometimes integrate us incorrectly. That's expected. So sometimes we get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of errors because the publisher integrated this incorrectly. We split those out. We don't follow our jobs. We effectively prepare a notification internally. We then talk to the publisher and say, hey, could you please fix that? It's not how you're going to make money working with us. And just to prove this, I'm going to sort of show you the kind of, if you wanted to do by hand what the framework is doing it, you could write a whole bunch of pretty complicated SQL. And if we ran that, and I'm using SQL simply because it looks the same whether you're too used to Python or Scala or R, you'd get about the same answer. Which then, of course, allows you to do some very, very unique and custom things related to your data. Like in this case, I can get a picture of how the errors are distributed based on my inputs. And I can immediately see what's going on here. 
because I know I already I know about the negative number exceptions, and there's this thing on the right around 100. Pretty simple, really. The key point here is that you don't have to use the code if, for example, you're not using Scala to take advantage of the idea and the convention. The convention is when you have complex cases with expected errors to not work with your data plain, but to work with your data plus things. If you use the standard field names that we are suggesting in this package, you can actually use our Scala tooling in a multi-language environment like, say, Databricks to query the output of your jobs in, from Python or Spark or Clojure. You could also take the pattern and build your own custom tools for faster and deeper root cause analysis, just like we had. All this at the cost of about 15 lines of code and almost no storage overhead. Almost no storage overhead because most of the time there are no errors, so all the fields are null. And Parquet does run length encoding and storing a whole bunch of nulls is very, very cheap. You get bulletproof job execution. You get row-level logs. Again, not just exceptions, but debug messages, warnings related to potential data quality issues that should be investigated. Um, you get the automatic metric collection. You have automatic data quality checks, which of course you can extend. And you can collect custom metrics, of course. You have a framework for identifiable errors. And all this is transparent for users of your data. Now that, to me, is, is pretty magical. I would argue that any complex data production, particularly if you're dealing with data coming from untrusted sources or outside sources, could benefit from using this type of pattern. Again, don't focus on the code and the fact that we open source the project. Focus on the core idea here, which is that great magic comes from great convention. Spark can never do that, will never do that, because it is a general purpose data processing platform. But you can get huge gains in productivity by picking certain best practice patterns and applying them to your own use cases. At Swoop, we have a magic toolkit that involves a bunch of different things. I talked about records today, mostly in idempotence. Idempotence and resilient partition tables and various other things are covered by my talk uh, last year. And the gains we've gotten have been pretty huge. You know, interactive data analysis and exploration, many times faster. Job reliability has really shot through the roof. And root cause analysis, literally about 100 times faster compared to the early days when we started using Spark. So you can get our magic at this URL or simply if you Google. Send me a note and swoop at uh, spark at swoop.com if you want more to be notified if we release anything new. But more importantly, I'd like for you to think about what patterns you have in your data processing or machine learning, feature preparation, and then think about how you can create magical solutions around them. Even just share them with other members of the community. You may find you have the same problems, and then you can work together to solve them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simone, for that eloquent and persuasive case why root cause analysis really helps developers. Uh, we have about a minute and a half. Uh, we can take one question if you want. I know it's time for a coffee break, but you can wait for some caffeine if you want. I'll be really. here after. You shouldn't be to and just come up and we can chat. Right. The benefit of the break. Absolutely. Okay, if nobody's here, big hand to Simone. Please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.